warrior societies, law and order, and dance societies of the Crow Nation. Many cultures retain their stories and memories by telling and retelling the information and pass them down from one generation to the next. This is called oral history. The following is an educational program about the warrior societies, law and order, and dance societies of the Crow Nation. We will cover the warrior societies called the Fox and the Lumpwoods. We will also discuss the Big Dogs and the Crazy Dogs. We will cover the ranks in the societies and how the Crow males rose in position from water boy to helper to warrior to scout to chief scout to a pipe carrier to the status of chief and to the highest status owner of the camp. We will cover how the warrior societies enforced the behavior and discipline of Crow society. We will also discuss the post-reservation warriors, post-reservation law and order, and contemporary law and order. We will also discuss the dance societies of the Crow Nation, the Sioux, the Nighthawk dancers now referred to as the Nighthawks, the Untouchables, and the Big Year Lope societies. Five knowledgeable Crow tribal members were interviewed. Brief introductions to follow. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow was appointed the official tribal historian by the Crow Tribal Council. His Indian name is Highbird. He is a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Nation. Carson walks over ice, his Crow name as Buffalo Chief, and he is from the Big Lodge Clan. He is the war dance chief of the Lodgegrass District and is a member of the Nighthawk Dance Society. Dr. Barney Old Coyote is known as Young White Buffalo Bullcalf, a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Nation. Dr. Old Coyote is a founder and member of the Crow Cultural Committee. Victor Singer's Crow name is Little Bird. Victor is a member of the Big Lodge Clan. Presently, Victor is the official drum keeper for the Nighthawk Drum Group and is a member of the Nighthawk Dance Society. Victor is a civil engineering technician with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and is also one of the Crow Nation's camp criers. Thomas Larson Medicine Horse's Crow name is First Man and he is a member of the Big Lodge Clan. He is the current Bighorn County Sheriff in Hardin, Montana and was a former Sundance Chief. During the pre-reservation period, the Fox and Lumpwood Warrior Societies of the Crow Nation were formed for military duties. They were like clubs and competed with one another for membership and for honors. The Big Dogs were retired warriors who taught younger boys the art of becoming a warrior and were mentors to those who sought to join the societies. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow discusses the societies and the uniqueness of the crazy dogs. In the pre-reservation days, that is before 1870, the Crow tribe <clears throat> is pretty well organized. It's like a pie. One section represents the religion. One section represents the economics. One section represents the <clears throat> social organization, and another section represents the military. Now in the military, there are several <coughs> societies involved. For instance, <coughs> there are the Ijoque, means fox society. Then there's the Barajiche, means lumpwood society. So they kind of <coughs> They kind of compete for membership, just like uh, our modern uh, uh, fraternities, the sororities, and the colleges. Some some are quite strict. Otherwise, you get kicked out of there, and it's a, a shameful thing to be cast out of a society. Then there's another one, Big Dogs, which is out there. It's one of those uh, old military societies. Chihuahua, crazy dog. It's kind of an individual thing. It's a pledge, individual pledge to die fighting. So 
Then they would announce, they want to be a crazy doll. So they go through dance, and the sadhus, the way they dress, they wear a red outfit. Then when the opportunity had come, say, the suits were coming, well, here he's <coughs> going to the <coughs> final act. So he walked towards the enemy lines, stake himself all by himself, maybe not even a weapon, and they surround him person he was killed. That's a, a suicidal thing. Boys and young men of the Crow Nation yearned to be members of warrior societies, but they had to prove themselves worthy, beginning from water boy to helper to warrior to scout and chief scout he could become a pipe carrier and eventually the Bajaycha, the good man or chief, and to the highest rank owner of the camp. Those who did were the most capable of warriors. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow will read from a paper he wrote explaining this process. It's kind of a process that they go through too besides being on the war path. All right, let's say here at the bottom here, a uh, water boy in the military we call orderlies, <laughs> kind of, sometimes they're called flunkies. They take a young boy along, 12 or 13. Oftentimes the fathers or grandfathers say, take this boy now. So whenever they stop, whenever they stop to wrestle for the night, why well, he'd go <clears throat> do this and that, maybe bring firewood, maybe bring water. If there's meat, why well, he takes care of it. He's a helper. That's his, that's the start. Next, he becomes a same thing, helper. While he <clears throat> gets a little higher up, uh, starts uh, doing a little more uh, <clears throat> important tasks, like maybe sitting and watching and things like that. And so it gets a little <clears throat> difficult. Then the third one, he becomes a warrior. Then by that time, he's at maybe, say, 15, 16, he's going up there, and he's been on several of these campaigns, so he knows what's going on, so now he's a warrior now. His weapons are all fixed up, and um, he's one of the warriors, you know. Well, in modern military, we call him, let's say, he's an enlisted man. All right, next he becomes a scout. So during those years, he <clears throat> had shown indications that he's got pretty good eyesight, he <clears throat> can hear the long distance, and is a good fast runner. He's got the qualities to be a scout. So he's gone up to be a scout. Chaitehu, the wolf, he becomes a wolf. And that's an important job, too. Whenever there's a war party going out to the enemy country, a scout, or maybe it's two scouts, is a far ahead of them, a party, say, a quarter of a mile, way ahead. Then, of course, it's got to <clears throat> find some good shelter, whether there's wood or there's water. So he's ahead all the time. That's a dangerous job, too. But after a while, he goes up a little more. Say, <clears throat> in the a given war party, <clears throat> maybe there's several, several scouts, capable of scouts, but one is a leader. He's, a, uh, he's better than these other ones. He's a chief scout. Then he starts <clears throat> looking for wardies, you know, the four that I mentioned. So he starts <clears throat> accumulating wardies. Attributes a chief must possess. All right. First, must have wisdom in human affairs so as to keep, keep the, the tribe in unity and harmony. Now he's in charge, <clears throat> the head man, the leader of the tribe, unified and in good uh, uh, <clears throat> situation, good condition, good state of being, so to speak. Then two, must have upright character and good personality, always honest, fair, and kind. The third, 
<clears throat> must be benevolent to all his people and see that all provided with the necessities of life. Lots of food, safe from the <clears throat> enemy tribes, and living quite well, prosperously. And fourth, must have good and strong medicine or spiritual insight and power to cope with unusual and supernatural situations. So, <clears throat> these <clears throat> leaders, so-called chiefs, were not ordinary <laughs> individuals. They had gone on <clears throat> vision questing and acquired power. <laughs> White men like to say medicine, medicine man, but they're men of spiritual power. Bach, Bach. They're not ordinary men. So with all their attributes, plus their sacred power, they're great leaders. We've got many, many of them throughout the history of the Crow tribe. Chief of all chiefs. By that I mean there are many chiefs, but one, somehow because of the quality and the quantity of his war deeds and his innate personality, character, all those good traits, is recognized as a chief of all chiefs. Whenever the bands, the river crows, mountain crows, whenever they come together for a rendezvous every two, three years, that he's recognized as a chief of all the crow tribe, a chief of all chiefs. During the pre-reservation period, warrior societies were made responsible for the behavior and discipline of Crow society. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow continues. Under the caravan, caravan chief, uh, there would be guards, security guards. So they have a police system <coughs> consisting of uh, two of those societies, you know, Yehoka, the foxes. For a period of time, maybe several months, <clears throat> they're the police uh, security forces. They watch uh, <clears throat> what's going on inside the camp, you know, that there's no stealing going on, no messing around, no uh, pillaging, things like that. Then when they're on a move to another location, we have a, uh, they watch the, the procession, you know, Watch them on each side and see that nobody's lagging behind or anybody's swinging out that way on his own. Or, so they keep that caravan in good uh, <clears throat> order. If something happens in the tribe, say a man killed another person, homicide, then it's a serious situation. The relatives of the slain person want to vengeance there. So the <clears throat> relatives of the slain person are getting organized, getting their weapons ready to move over there, and, <clears throat> and the, the security people run up there and get the, a pipe man, one of the medicine men over here, to come and intervene. So he'd come there with his pipe, you know. His pipe and the security were watching to see that they <clears throat> They don't jump at each other. So the medicine man came and calls the two together, the head men, I suppose, and offer them, smoke this and put aside your evil intent. You smoke this and forgive them. <clears throat> and, uh, and you smoke this and <clears throat> make restitution of some kind. So we'll make out a, <clears throat> work out a, peaceful settlement by offering the pipe. Early reservation law and order was an extremely strict and sometimes harsh period for the Crow people. Warriors no longer had any authority among the people due to the strict governance of the Indian agent. During the earliest part of the reservation system, the Crow, a free and nomadic people, were not allowed to leave reservation boundaries. Doctors Joseph Medicine Crow and Barney Old Coyote tell us about these times. When the reservation was 
established 1870, and an Indian agent appointed, he was a boss. He had the United States military to back him up. That's one. Also, he established his own Indian police force to work against their own people. So <clears throat> uh, there would be a chief of police in charge of the other policemen. They have the superintendent, the agent would have a bunch there in the <clears throat> agency all the time. Sometimes they get harsh on uh, their own people. The agent up there had to force what we call the secretary's uh, orders of 1884. He had uh, issued orders not to dance, not to speak in the Crow language, not to have uh, sun dances, and uh, is do not, hundreds of things, of uh, things that Crow's not supposed to do. And it was this a police force that had forced those, you know. <laughs> uh, what they did, a buddy, they, would, they throw them in and, and uh, just give them bread and water for quite a long time. Big medicine. Ma'uf Pachash. Ma'uf Pachash. I think he was a policeman too and a judge. But they were considered as bullies among the crow because all of a sudden, here was this non-distinct person who was not a warrior and all of a sudden he had authority of the superintendent and he became a bully and uh, the prime consideration there was the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the Office of Indian Affairs wanted to send Indian students away to school, particularly boys and uh, they were going to take them forcibly they'd go into the house, into the camp and uh, take a child and send them off to school. The policemen were the ones that took the children. They just take the child right out of the mother's arms and put them on a train and send them back east to a, to a boarding school. We grow up fearing the police. Uh, other people in this country see the police as protection, but because of this uh, syndrome among the crow, uh, the crows fear the police. The contemporary reservation system of law and order is modern and has a trained police force. As in any large community, there are many law enforcement problems. Bighorn County Sheriff Larson Medicine Horse discusses a few topics related to the history of the Crow Nation. Our grandma used to say that the police used to come and just drag the kids off and as a matter of fact, my dad said that he was one of them, where they took him from the house and he wound up in uh, South Dakota. Now, I've heard Mama say, if you don't behave, the cop's going to take you and throw you in jail. Or we'll take you over there and the doctor will give you a shot. So we have a strike against us before we even start, and that's because we're kind of the boogeyman for the, for the families. And instead, if a child is in trouble, they should be running to us. Instead, they see a cop, they run the other way. It's, it's interesting working there in Hardin as a sheriff. When you remember signs and windows of cafes and things like that, that says no Indians or dogs allowed. And if you, and if you go to Hardin now, the county attorneys in Northern Cheyenne Sheriff is a crow, that's me. County commissioners are, are Indians. The clerk of the district court is an Indian. She's a crow. And uh, I think most, most of the department heads are all uh, tribal members. After the reservation was established, warriors had no authority, but they refused to let their competitive spirit die. They transformed their activities into dance societies. One, the Sioux. Two, the Nighthawk Dancers, now known as Nighthawks. Three, the Untouchables. And four, the Big Earlobes. After <clears throat> the Crow Indians were 
settled on the Crow Indian Reservation, the intertribal war days were over. However, these organizations, these societies, <coughs> continued, but they, they would compete each other in social ways, and athletics, and, and they, that's been going on all along, even to this day. So when the agency was moved here in 1884, because we're going to people settling up Bighorn, down Bighorn, <coughs> up Little Bighorn, Lodge Grass Creek, they started having their own. They were going to, at Crow Fair time, that's when the, the real competition takes place. <coughs> the districts have their own camps. So each, every night, they would dance over there. And judges go around checking, you know, check the black lodge prior over here, big horn here, large grass here. Then uh, they give prizes for <clears throat> the most dancers and, uh, and the best singers and so forth. So <clears throat> that's when, uh, what we call Wadawes, so hot dance. Had become uh, quite uh, quite the thing, you know. Up to World War II, during the Depression, and during World War II in Europe, and of course here in Pacific, the Indians <coughs> at this this part of the country, you know, had quit dancing, quit making costumes, kind of going with quit singing. So after World War II, we came back, and. Uh, <clears throat> Some of us uh, wanted to dance. So we got together, a bunch of us here in Lazica. So we started uh, dancing, you know. We had some good singers. Donald Nero was a good singer. Fred Thompson was a good singer. And uh, Arliss Whiteman was a good singer. We had some good singers. So they'd sing, and Hank O'Kayet, myself, Tom Yellowtail, and uh, Perry Eastman, Harry Beads, and uh, some others, my mother and, and the others, they, they started dressing up and they danced with us. So we'd go around dancing, we'd go to the Black Lodge and dance over there and, and they quit dancing, they'd come and look at put us and they started dressing up too. And we'd go to St. Nick's. We'd go to Busby, they quit all together over there. Quit singing, quit dancing, quit making clothes. So we'd go there and, <clears throat> and dance over there and invite them to come in. Finally, they started dancing too. <laughs> These guys that I mentioned are humorous <laughs> individuals like Harry Beach, Henry always cu cutting up and making people uh, laugh and so forth. So they call crazy dancers. <laughs> but uh, we got the dancing back. Each society has a, has a war dance chief, a drum keeper, a drumstick owner, an uh, announcer, women singers, uh, the crooked stick owner, and a horsewhip owner. Let's see what else is there. Oh no, tail end dancer. So you have about eight officers that you have in each society, and they all had them. See, in Lodgegrass we had. Uh, I'm the war dance chief for the for the Nighthawks. My brother Lewis is the drumstick owner. Uh, the announcers are. Uh, let's see, the announcers are Sunny Pretty on top, uh, Sunny Black Eagle. And uh, there's four women singers. No, it's actually six. The war dance chief is the guy that has to be there the first time every dance. He has to be the first guy. He's the one that runs the whole show. The drumstick owner, he's the one that comes in and says, we can't start without him. The singers, when they sit down, they can't set the drum down. It has to be sitting on its side. And not until he comes in, and then when he comes in, he sets his stuff down and says, okay, we're ready. So the drum, the war dance chief tells the drumstick owner, okay, go ahead and hit it now. So we'll start. The Sioux Society was, was named after the, you know, our enemies, the Sioux. That's how they got their name, an honorable enemy. So they said, well, they kind of named that society after them. The unequaled is, was kind of a, 
some of the guys in there were, you know, outstanding warriors. So they they said their record couldn't be equaled, that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. that, but it means large hole in their earlobe. So they just shorten it to re. They're more oriented in district wise. Um, Lodge grass being separate at times from the rest of the, either by design or by choice, uh, had their own separate celebration maybe during the holidays, the Christmas holidays, New Year's. I'm sure that all of the other two, the Kohusug, uh, the Koder, probably are existing in all of the districts of the reservation. Uh, but the two most active at this present time is the the Re Society and the uh, Ochesh Bhadava. In the night in the dance societies, you would you'd, you'd say you'd get a list of uh, people that you're going to adopt into this society, and whoever has the night that night, if it's a night hawk night or Re night, or, for example, the Ochesh Bhadava. You get these people out and you sing the, you dance with them, all of the the Nighthawk members or the Ochesh Bhadwe members would dance with those prospective adoptees, Irabat to You dance with them and then after you've danced them to their society song, you, you, uh, you give them gifts. Uh, monetary or material or whatever, but that saying that they're a member of that society now. From then on, whenever we have some doings that require, we need all of you to come out and help the society so we make it a success. It's just like a club. We get together, we dance, we have fun. We put together a uniform. Like they'll say, everybody has to wear a red, a red uh, cape, and we all dress the same. And then we try to compete against uh, the Rees, have a bigger dance, more dancers, uh, more fun. We do the sweetheart dance. The, the Nighthawk men have to dance with money, and dance with the Rees women, and vice versa. Then the Nighthawk women get up and then dance with the Rees men. And, and then one of the societies will feed, and the other society will eat, that kind of thing. And they, you tease each other. And then after the sun goes down, it's a different time. It's, it's time for socializing. So these, like these uh, uh, dance societies would schedule or have an event, you know, or dancing or uh, they sponsor something. And so, and just like the name implies, Kohus, they want to do something that outdoes all the other societies, see. Uh, so I think those are always a part of our, our culture, and we still believe and still observe that, those things. So just like any other uh, uh, civilized society, we have singing and dancing. So they probably, the, these dance societies evolved to sponsor these events. You know, and, and we incorporate a lot of things into our culture. This educational program was above warrior societies, the fox, the lumpwoods, the big dogs, and the crazy dogs. We also discussed the rank in the warrior societies, where they worked their way up from water boy to helper, to warrior, to scout, chief scout, pipe carrier, and to a good man, or bajaycha, and eventually the owner of the camp, Asheaga. We also discussed the warrior societies, which were responsible for the behavior and discipline of the Crow villages. We heard from Crow tribal members who talked about the early post-reservation and more contemporary law and order on the Crow reservation. We also discussed how the warrior societies evolved into dance societies after the Crow were forced to live on a reservation. We would like to thank Dr. Barney Old Coyote, Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, Carson Walks Over Ice, Victor Singer, and Larson Medicine Horse for sharing their knowledge and expertise with us.